Salutations once again to the Truth Corps, wherever you may be on the planet, and whoever. I'm here with the third installment on Gnostic Sabotage, and the title is The Last Judgment, A Script Analysis. The word script goes to Hollywood, right? It goes to screenwriting films. Every film has a script, and good films have good scripts. They're well written. But what's the difference between script and scripture? Well, as you may know, as you may well know, scripture is a very big deal among Jews and Christians, and also among Muslims. Scripture is the word of God, the revealed word of God. That's the standard definition. So scripture written down, say, in the Old Testament and the New Testament and Revelation, that is the Judeo-Christian foundation document, those three books together, well, devotees of that religion regard Scripture as the revealed word of God, meaning that it has either come directly from an encounter with God, Moses on Mount Sinai, or it has come through prophets and inspired men with beards living in ancient times who had visionary moments in which they saw things that were revealed to them by God. Now, these prophetic visions of the Old Testament are various, and I'm not going to take the time to go through them all, but I'll mention a couple because it contributes to my point. For instance, the visions of Ezekiel. He saw, he saw in the sky four animal faces and shining wheels. And that particular vision, if you look at it, was a vision of the Abrahamic off-planet Father God revealing himself through these figures. It's also, as you may know, been widely interpreted as a UFO sighting. Now take careful note as we get started here that the vision of Ezekiel is a vision of the supreme creator God, not an enemy of God or not some kind of satanic monster. Then when you go to the visions of Daniel, for instance, you find that Daniel saw other things, but he did not see the supreme father God. In fact, the vision of Daniel is rather complex, and it does have some elements which resemble, possibly, elements that you see in the composition of the great beast. For instance, he saw four beasts that came out of the sea, and one of them had ten horns, and then oddly sprouted an eleventh horn. And then he saw a lamb, there's a lamb in Revelation, there's two actually, with two horns. And what happened in his vision? What did he witness? Well, he witnessed an attack of these theriomorphic powers upon the people of God, that is to say, upon his own people, the ancient Hebrews. So in the vision of Ezekiel, there's no attack, there's just a revelation of the Father God. But in the vision of Daniel, you have an adversarial scenario, as you have in Revelation. Now, if I may prevail upon your patience, let's just stop here for a second so that I can cover my ass. Remember that I've made an outstanding claim. I've said that I differ from the scholarly experts in the dicey topic of Jewish apocalypticism. How so exactly? Well, I claim that there are elements 
in the script of the book of Revelation and actors and events that cannot be consistently and uniformly derived from previous scripts of prophetic vision in the Old Testament. Now, I have done seven long talks on Gnostic sabotage in the book of Revelation, and I'm in the process of editing them, editing them and reformatting them and adding text to the text I've already written with illustrations, and I'll point you to one of those illustrations eventually. And so there is a fuller argument to be developed here. I realize in the abbreviated material that I'm presenting, it could be argued even by an amateur Christian, not a scholar, that I am wrong in saying that the elements that appear in the visions of Daniel, for instance, do not reappear slightly modified in the apocalypse script. But I can't take the time to refute that argument right now. It would take more, it would take, it would require the evidence and comparison of more material. So I ask you to bear with me as I am presenting this topic in an abbreviated manner. Looking at those visions, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, I don't know how many they are, I'll cover them all in the revised version of that book when it comes out on Nemata, or when it comes out in a book form. But one thing you can say as a generalization, an accurate generalization, is that these prophecies fall into two kinds. Well, they're not always prophecies. They are and they aren't. Prophecies become attached to them. So there are basically two kinds of visions in the Old Testament and two interpretations attached to them. One is simply the vision of the supreme deity, as with Ezekiel. And there's no confrontation there at all. However, according to the historical interpretation, what Ezekiel saw can be related to historical events in his time. Or it can be brought forward into apocalyptic events in our time. Those are the two interpretations, historical, contemporary with the vision, and apocalyptic coming forward to now. The other type of script coming out of the Old Testament is the judgment scenario, the war in heaven, which is a universal mythological theme. However, you find it in a unique version in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, this second type of script or scenario is a conflict, describes a conflict between God and whatever or whoever is against the Abrahamic deity. Clear enough? Now, having framed up those different scenarios in the way they can be interpreted, let's ask the question, well, what type of scenario is presented in the book of Revelation? Well, it's a judgment scene the last judgment. So does that represent perhaps a third type of visionary narrative? The book of Revelation contains a vision of the supreme deity sitting on a throne in heaven and on his one side, I can never remember whether it's left or right, there is his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. On the other side, there's a book sitting in a chair. And in front of those three characters, there is the Lamb of God, spelled with a capital L. So there is a lamb in the heavenly scenario, and that vision corresponds to Ezekiel's perspective, you see seeing God. But why does God 
and his son, the Messiah, appear in that way in heaven. Well, they are there to judge the world. So, Revelation is a judgment scenario, which makes it a little bit different than the two others that I've characterized. Now, in a judgment scenario, what happens? Well, there is a supreme judge. There are those who are to be judged, the accused, who have committed crimes and sins. And then there ensues the act of punishment for those whom God rejects as evil and the salvation of those who win the approval of God by their obedience. That's the overall structure of the last judgment scenario. So who are the sinners? Who is being judged? Well, it's you and me. It's the entire population of the world. It's humanity consisting of all the human races except one. And that other race is aligned with the Supreme Judge. Now, I'd say it's fairly obvious from this sketchy approach, as I say, to be more thorough would take a lot more time. I think it's pretty obvious that a judgment scenario is not a battle. And yet there is a battle connected with the last judgment. Remember that Daniel saw satanic or evil supernatural forces, including a lamb, including beasts with horns. And those forces had the intention of attacking the people of God, that is to say, the authors of those visions, the authors of those books in the Old Testament, as well as the author of the book of Revelation, who was a Hebrew known as John the Divine, or Saint John. So it's the revelation of Saint John, right? So there is a a battle that occurs described in the visions of John here. But hold on a minute. The script of the Last Judgment could actually be adequate and complete without a battle. Picture a courtroom, the heavenly courtroom, and you and I and everyone else in the world who lives or who has ever lived is on trial. And the outcome of that trial will be punishment for some and absolution for others who will then be delivered into the presence of God. That's how the script works. And if you stop and think about it for a moment, you can see that that script could work with no adversarial scenes. Imagine a courtroom. The trial takes place. And the judge and jury are the same. The Father God and his messianic son are the judge and jury. And the accused are there, and the trial proceeds, but there's no riot or battle in the, in the, in the courtroom, you see? See that? There's no, the audience does not get up and attack the judge and jury. So the revelation of St. John could have been written in that way, and had it been written that way, it would have been a valid and adequate narrative of the Last Judgment. But it's not written in that way. There is, in addition, there are other scenes, and these are scenes of confrontation. There are forces that oppose the Father God. There is opposition 
to him, to the Messiah, and to his entire plan. And that opposition comes from the great beast. Now, if I'm being skillful and correct in analyzing the script, then you can see that the last judgment as foreseen in biblical prophecy in scripture cannot just happen like a courtroom scene. There is a riot. There is a war going on in the courtroom. And this makes the last book of the Bible quite unique. The elements of activity and the actors involved represent a unique scenario. Can you play along with that so far? See, I'm not here to indoctrinate you into my interpretation. I'm here to offer you an informed choice. You can follow the interpretation that I make based on looking at the script, just as we would sit down, for instance, and discuss the script of The Shining or Apocalypse Now, or The Deer Hunter, or any other film. Having said that, I've set you up to investigate this script according to the way I'm framing it. Framing is everything. Now, framing returns us to my initial proposition. I claim that there are elements in the book of Revelation that are anomalous. They are incongruent with the general trend of biblical visionary prophecy. There are elements that are weird, as if, I used this analogy before, the screenwriter was writing a screenplay, and he sat down with a friend, and the friend said, hmm, yeah, I see. You've got the story arc, you've got the uh, main characters, and you're developing it in this way. You've come past the midpoint, which is the peak of the story arc, the action described in the screenplay moves toward its resolution, its conclusion. Hey, but wait a minute. How about this? How about you insert these other characters into your screenplay? Characters that you didn't have in mind when you started to write it. So I'm claiming that this is actually what happened with the composition of the book of Revelation. And in the next talk, I'll describe how it happened, how it turned out that way, and who influenced the script, independent of those to whom it is attributed. Now, finally, it comes to the really exciting part comes to a question. If we were analyzing the script of The Shining, we would ask various questions about the characters and the actors, wouldn't we? And there are innumerable uh, documentaries and discussions and talks that do just that, because it's a complex film that can be viewed in various ways. For instance, I saw a brilliant deconstruction. I came across a brilliant deconstruction of The Shining recently. And the individual who did it presented the case that it was not Jack, the main male character played by Jack Nicholson, who was insane, but it was the female character played by Shelley Duvall, who was insane. How's that for a switch? Something like that now begins to appear as a possibility as we analyze this script. Why? 
because the big question comes into view. If the script describes the power of the Supreme Father God to judge and condemn and punish the world and destroy the world at the end, first of all, the script shows you that the Supreme Father God has the ability to wreak havoc on the earth through the four horsemen, through the angels who release the vials of poison. So in the process of judgment, Father God inflicts enormous terror upon the world. It's a terrorist event you see described here. And in the end, there is a punishment, a verdict and a punishment. Those who are convicted of sin after being tortured and terrorized are thrown into perdition, into the bottomless pit of hell. But it doesn't just happen that way without interference, does it? Opposition appears. And the big question is, what is actually the true nature of this opposition? Well, where does it come from? And what is the true threat? Is there a true threat? You see, this is the question. If you have a scenario that describes not only the last judgment act of terror and punishment, but also describes an adversarial conflict between God and the so-called or alleged or presumed enemy of God, the great beast, it begs the question, is this a real battle or is it just a mock battle? That exactly is the question that came to me nine years ago when I first brought out this material. I asked myself, what did John think? Well, you get what I mean, the other John. Did he think that the great beast could actually defeat the Father God at the moment of the end of the world and the last judgment scenario? Or did he see it as simply a mock battle? Is the great beast a real threat? Is the great beast a power, some kind of supernatural power that can actually oppose and defeat the Father God? Or is the great beast merely represented in the script to show that the Father God cannot be defeated? Take a moment and reflect on that question. Can you see the two alternatives that arise in this analysis? Either the great beast, a force that intends to oppose and overthrow the Father God, really can do that, or it can't. And if it can't, then the adversarial scenario depicted when the great beast arises out of the sea is simply a setup, a mock battle in which the defeat of the great beast is a foregone conclusion, according to the scriptwriter. Now, in the longer version, of Gnostic Sabotage in the book of Revelation, I look into the mentality of the author, whom I call the Mad Monk. And I look into his mind and I ask, does he really believe that the power of God can be defeated? Now you could ask that question of Christians living today. Christians who place an enormous value on the book of Revelation and who see the apocalyptic visions in that narrative being fulfilled in our time here and now. 
for instance, those who equate the great beast with AI, or what is being called the beast system. So here we are in 2021, and to many minds and hearts, it appears as if the beast system is being implemented. You get a mark, it's a genetic marker. Would that not be the ultimate expression of the mark of the beast? Many people think so. And I venture to say that you don't have to be a Christian, self-professed Christian, to see a threat in the great beast AI system, which is the ultimate weapon of transhumanism. So the question is, can the transhumanists using AI and AT defeat humanity? But the question in Revelation is, can the great beast defeat the Father God and the Messiah? Is it a real threat or is it only a threat artificially constructed to prove the ultimate indefeatable power of the Abrahamic God? I contend that that question tormented the mad monk who is presumed to be the author of this script. Although in the next talk, I'll go more deeply into how this script was composed and compiled and finally put into written form. Now, in concluding this talk, I'm going to complete the analysis by listing the actors in the script, the different roles. So when you write a film script, and I've written a few, you have, of course, the outline of a story. And then there are the actors. So a screenwriter will always make a list of who are the principal actors, the supporting actors, and the extras in a film. So let's do that with this narrative. Imagine that we take a sheet of paper and we divide it down the middle. And on the left side, we list the characters and actors in the scenario who belong to what I'm going to call God's army of terror, judgment, and annihilation. So who are the actors in that army on the left side of the piece of paper? The Supreme Father God on his throne in heaven. 200,000 thousand warriors in his army. You find this in a passage. The 24 elders who also sit in heaven. The lamb on the throne, the lamb of God, said to have been slain before the foundation of the world. The wrathful angels, of which there are many, some of them release seven vials of poison and plagues upon the earth. The four horsemen, the archangel Michael or Mikael, who is presumably the commander of God's army of judgment, punishment, and annihilation, and the Son of God, the divine figure, the Messiah, Jesus. That's quite a crew. That's quite a lot of leading actors, supporting roles, and extras on the left side of the page. On the right side are the characters in what we'll simply call the opposition, the opposition to the divine creator, the divine plan, and the divine will. Who are the characters and actors in the opposition? Well, there is a red dragon that first appears in the sky and then is cast down to earth. And the script clearly shows 
that the red dragon reappears and emerges out of the waters of the earth in the form of the great beast. So the red dragon and the great beast are the same force. Then there is the lesser beast. Curious, there's actually two beasts, great beast and the lesser beast. And then there is the scarlet woman. So basically, if you equate the red dragon cast down from heaven with Tomega Therian, there are only three characters in the opposition. The red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns, the number 17. The scarlet woman who rides the dragon, making it 18, the number of the beast. And the lesser beast. Now the role of the lesser beast, ah, that's a sweet, sweet part of the story. But for right now, I won't get into exactly what or who is the lesser beast. I'll conclude by leaving you with this question. This is the essential question. I know I've said it a few times already, but at the risk of being repetitive, I'll say it one more time so that I can be really clear and concise in defining this question for you. Is the opposition really capable of defeating God? Or is God undefeatable in the face of any opposition? You see, it comes down to that and that alone. What does the apocalyptic scenario of the last book of the Bible show? Does it show a failed attempt of the opposition to defeat God, his messianic son, and the divine plan? Or not? Does it show the triumph of the Father God or the defeat of the Father God. And if it shows the defeat of the Father God, then how can that defeat be accomplished? What force exactly could achieve that defeat? And who, who might be aligned with that force? Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.